innocent or another baby, right? Excuse me there. Good, good. Alhamdulillah, Rabbani. Alhamdulillah. Wonderful, wonderful, alhamdulillah. Wonderful. This is great. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Great, great. Alhamdulillah. This is. Are you the one who's coming from Lansing? Oh, thank you very much for coming. I know it's a long, long driving. So. <laughs> Alright, so some people um, could not make it, but they have another commitment, and they we are trying to record this, we have no problem with that, and if you have extra uh, uh, materials here to uh, be distributed later on, wonderful, great, great. Whatever you guys want, I am ready. You, okay. you are the leaders here. So right? we will do the opening. Okay. Since this is our opening. Okay. Uh, just a couple of minutes after we do the um, just uh, you know after actual anything from the time of the start. Two minutes. Okay. And then that's challenging. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you can do it in as many minutes as you want. But you don't have a time limit. You're okay. Okay. Yeah. No, no, no. Exactly. Give me the microphone. I'm yes. Thank you. Cannot take it back. Exactly. <laughs> Will be the MC yes. for this. Okay, Khalas. Um, where y'all? Where is he sitting here? Mm -hmm. uh, he's sitting here, and then I'm gonna go and sit with the audience after that. Okay. And then there's one speaker who's coming, but she's not speaking yet. So I'm not quite sure where they are. Okay, so I'll be and sitting there. So.
السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله السميل العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن وله وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين ثم بعد Thank you very much for coming and uh, thanks to our sisters here who um, um, came to uh, talk to us about uh, foster care a very important subject that we really need to learn about um, I'll just reiterate some of the points I made today in the Friday khutbah that um, in Al-Quran, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about orphans about 22 times. One of which he reminded the Prophet himself, peace be upon him, who was an orphan himself. Alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa. Haven't he find you or an orphan then and, and he gave you sh shelter? So Rasulullah himself was an orphan and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him never ever being harsh on an orphan we must treat orphans with respect and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi one day a person came to him complaining that his heart is very hard and um, he wants the Prophet to give him a prescription something that makes his heart soft and um, to make his prayer answered and the Prophet peace be upon him said to him would you like that your heart becomes soft and that your you are um, your prayers are accepted and he said sallallahu alayhi wasallam be merciful with the orphan pat his head and feed him from the food you eat they will soften your heart and make your prayer answered and as I, I reminded my brothers and sisters today with this beautiful hadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said, I am the one who takes care of an orphan like these two fingers in paradise. Um, this is one of the kind of forms of worship that we um, sometimes overlook. And we really need to um, pay attention to this kind of, of worship or for form of ibadah that we really need to, um, uh, to follow. Another beautiful hadith, uh, I just want to remind br my brothers and sisters uh, with when Rasulullah sallallahu said about the best of all houses. He said in the hadith, the best house among the Muslims. Think about your house, the house in which you live. Which of our houses is the best house? He said the best house among the Muslims is the house in which orphans are well treated. And the opposite is also true. The worst of all houses among the Muslims is the house in which orphans are ill treated. So uh, we really, if we really want our homes to be um, uh, among the best homes, then we need to um, think about having an orphan that we need to um, uh, treat very well. Um, Muslim scholars talked about the kind of kafala to yatim. Uh, they talk about two main levels of kafala. The best or the highest level is to really have the yatim um, grow up in your house and give him the um, uh, love and education and um, guidance that he or she may need. Treat them as you treat your children. And this is um, what this was the norm in the time of the Sahaba عنه, when, when someone passes away and leaves behind children someone would take his children with him and this is exactly what Rasulullah said although Ali ibn Abi Talib was not an orphan but his father was too old he cannot really take care of them and they decided that every one of his relatives would take one of his children take care of him and he took Ali ibn Abi Talib um, and raised him وسلم, when Ali was very young he was six years old when the Prophet وسلم, received um, revelation so um, the second level is to donate money uh, that you know this money is good enough to take care of one child many uh, Islamic organizations actually they are running these programs where you can donate um, monthly or, or annually uh, an amount of money that would be good enough for uh, one orphan a boy or girl for his or her education clothes food and so on and so forth um, um, if we cannot afford the first then we should think about um, the second kind of kafalat al yatim as, as I mentioned also today that uh, the yatim is a very general term um, but the definition from Islamic legal perspective is the one who lost his father 
and he did not attain uh, or she did not attain the age of puberty. So this is the legal definition. However, uh, as I mentioned, uh, there are plenty of people who have their parents alive, but they cannot take care of them because they are behind bars. They are, you know, um, have mental uh, illnesses or or they, you know, suffer uh, physical um, uh, illnesses. Also, they cannot take care of their children. Um, or for many other reasons, or just their parents abandoned them, or one of their parents abandoned them. So these children, they lost this source of, of support and, and, and love and so on. So the, 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 the definition of orphan actually is uh, much larger than the legal definition. Um, and uh, there are two kind of children need um, our care. One is the orphan that we talked about, and one is not even known, nobody knows who are his parents. Um, and this happened uh, everywhere uh, when people just find a child um, that has been abandoned for one reason or the other. Um, and many people find this kind of more problematic because they don't know if this, uh, you know, a boy or girl, um, uh, they came out of marriage or legal, lawful marriage or not, and therefore it's, it's, a, it's a question mark. And in fact, we need to understand that this is not the uh, the problem or the uh, mistake of the children. Any child or even any animal has the right to be treated with respect. It's not the fault of the children that their parents abandoned them or have done something wrong. Any child, regardless of his parents' religion, his parents' commitment to any ethical standard, these children need help. We have, according to the statistics that I found this morning, facts about foster care in Michigan. This was 2010. I don't know if the number went up or down. 15,000 children in Michigan only need um, or in foster care. Um, a huge amount of children. And the good news is that there are plenty of good people of good conscience who uh, talk, took it upon themselves to take care of these children. This tip, um, and, and they called some of these children and they went through the, the process to get the license and to take some of these children to be raised with them. And many of these children go back to their uh, biological parents and many of them, um, you know, uh, they don't need foster care anymore because they grow up, but they needed this um, uh, foster care uh, very um, badly. Um, now with the um, waves of uh, immigrants coming to the state of Michigan um, very soon, some of them have arrived and others are I heard they will come sometime next year. Um, uh, we really need to open our hearts and our homes and our pockets um, to welcome these brothers and sisters who really um, have been traumatized. We have seen the news, just watching the news and seeing videos and pictures of people who lost their loved ones on the sea and those who um, uh, had to bury their own children and so on. This in of itself is, is traumatic. Um, and how about those who went through this experience? Uh, very difficult, very tough, very harsh. And uh, obviously they are coming to a new uh, world. Uh, they need so many different kinds of help. So we, um, I don't think I have to talk so much about how important it is to help people who are in need. Um, um, so um, I am here myself to, to learn and I have learned um, um, a good amount of knowledge when I went to the Muslim Unit Center two, day, two weeks ago and I was thrilled to see many um, local um, young organizations have been established to serve the need of um, um, these newcomers to the state of Michigan. We need to do more, we can do more, we just need to learn and think together and help one another get the guidance and just follow um, this guidance. Um, finally, I would just suggest um, that um, I made this point to other uh, Imams that um, the word refugee, as you all know, it has also some negative connotation. It's, it's more of a legal term. Um, the way it's covered and, and the people sometimes misuse this word as, as um, people of less um, or lower class in a way. Uh, we don't want to use this term. I would suggest that we should use the word immigrants. Um, people uh, migrate from one place to the other and settle in these new places. Uh, for different reasons. We know why um, these newcomers to Michigan are, are here. Um, many of them they have good life there um, and they didn't want to leave their country, but they had to. So um, I'm afraid the word refugee, if it stays with them, it will also 
um, um, could hurt their feeling or put them in a situation um, where um, word itself is uh, misunderstood. So the, they would be misunderstood as well, especially um, younger uh, children who will grow up here and they will feel that they have been discriminated because they are the children of the refugees. Um, so um, the word immigrants, I think, is more uh, appropriate, uh, just uh, my suggestion. And now I will give the microphone to the experts. Uh, we have um, uh, um, uh, foster parents. Uh, they will share with you their experience. And we have uh, Sister Amanda from uh, the Lutheran um, uh, uh, service. So she will also go through the process and educate us about what we need to do in order to be able to be licensed uh, uh, foster parents. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward uh, our speakers who um, uh, took their time to share their knowledge with us. Thank you, Imam Ali. That was a beautiful introduction to this very important topic, and I am so grateful for all of you taking the time out on a busy Friday to come and listen to what we have to share with you tonight. Um, as Imam Ali said, tonight's session is um, an informational session on fostering um, not only um, refugees and migrants um, of war, but also um, domestic foster care. There is a significant difference between um, the two types of foster care, and I uh, hope and pray, inshallah, by the end of this evening, you all have enough information um, and that you would all consider seriously becoming licensed as a foster parent. And even if you are not at that point, by the end of this evening, there is a role for every single person in this room to help out. Um, in the community um, for this great need. So um, first, I would like to introduce my dear friend, Rania Shabib, who is, um, became a domestic and refugee foster care um, parent with her husband, Anas Obeid, through Lutheran Social Services of Michigan. She welcomed a Muslim refugee foster child into her home this summer. She's also a mother of three. She works with um, MMCC, um, Michigan Muslim Community Council, and the Syrian American Rescue Network to raise awareness for foster care needs in our local Muslim communities. So Rania is going to speak first just in terms of some general information on foster care, and then she will come back um, and speak as a um, foster parent and what her personal experience has been. Rania. Thank you. Um, one of our panelists, Muna Youssef, was not able to be here tonight, um, and I asked if I could use her notes and share the information with you guys so we don't miss out on that. Um, so Muna works with the Wayne County Family Courts, and she sees some of the foster kids and their cases as they come through the courts. Um, so I, I wanted to share some of her information. Please bear with me as I go through her notes because uh, this is from Muna's perspective, not from my, pers not from my experience. Um, so the numbers that she has for us are that there are 400,000 children nationwide in foster care. 100,000 of them are eligible for adoption. In Michigan, there are 13,000 children that are in foster care. Might be a little bit a different number. Um, maybe it has to do with the, the date of reporting. 3,000 of the 13,000 are eligible for adoption. In Michigan, there are a known, no, the known number of Muslim children that are in foster care is between 50 to 75. Um, the purpose of foster care is to protect the children and preserve the family. The goal for foster care in most cases is reunification. And when we talk about refugee foster care, um, you'll see that with refugee foster care, that's usually not the case, reunification, uh, for, but for domestic it is. Now, why do children come into foster care? Um, for domestic children, it is that they enter the foster care system when the parent or legal guardian responsible for the child is unable to meet the child's basic needs 
or significantly endangers the child or allows the child to be endangered. So this could include um, issues such as substance abuse, unaddressed or out of control mental health problems, homelessness, poverty, physical abuse, domestic abuse, sexual abuse, or it could even be the death of the parents or guardians. And that list there, it's important to note that our Muslim community is not immune to those issues. Um, and we do have Muslim children that enter the foster care system. The age of foster children are between the ages of being a newborn up until 21 years old. They have varying backgrounds of race, religion, varying disabilities possibly, social economic status. Um, there is almost always trauma in the cases because the children are pulled from their, um, their home of their birth parents or the home that they're familiar with and taken to a completely new home, completely new family. So there is some degree of trauma and that the level of trauma varies. Foster children, as with all children, are very resilient and with proper support, these children um, will thrive. No one chooses to be in the foster care. No one chooses to be in foster care. Um, if you or your children have a stable and nurturing home environment, then that is due to Allah's blessings, and it is not something that we earned. It's a blessing. Every child deserves a chance to succeed. Every child deserves a family and a community. We, The US, we don't have orphanages here. I know there are some parts of the world that do have orphanages. The goal is to allow the foster child to be placed in the most family-like setting. And this setting should be most similar to what this child's um, family, family culture, family religion is like. Now, we rely on the foster, foster homes to place these children so that they have a place that is stable for them. Now, to be a foster parent, what makes a good foster parent? You have to be over the age of 21 or older. Um, the educational background varies. Um, no prior experience is necessary. You can own or rent your home or apartment. Um, you do need to be financially stable. And of course, the ability to love and show love, to be nurturing, patient, and, um, and flexible. Amazing foster parents show relentless love. And fostering, Mona has here that fostering is harder than parenting. And she said this because when it is your own birth child, then you have raised that child from when they were an infant. But when a child comes to your home that is already used to a certain home environment and is now entering your home, and now they have to become accustomed to your home rules and your home um, situation, then there's definitely a transition. And that, that's harder than, than raising the child from when they were, from when they were an infant. Now, it's important to note that um, this is not an issue that we can fix with just money and throwing money at it. Uh, I know our communities are very generous and very willing to donate money, um, but this is something that requires um, something much more valuable. It requires effort, energy, heart, love, and perseverance. It's our religious obligation to care for the children in need. And when a Muslim child enters the foster care system, it relaxes the tension when a child, when this Muslim child can enter a Muslim home, um, that puts the birth parents' minds at ease, and it makes the transition a little bit easier for that foster child. And this can help in family. This can help the family achieve reunification. Of course, it also allows the children um, a greater possibility or greater degree of holding on to their dean when they're with a, a family that has their same religious beliefs. Now, if you choose to become a foster parent, you can specify what age, gender, background you're willing to take. There are many options. And again, usually this is temporary. In some cases, it is more long-term and possibly permanent. Um, I believe that Muslims should be an integral part of the foster care system. We should be the, at the forefront of taking in the domestic the Muslim domestic foster children, the Muslim refugee foster children, and then really any foster child, regardless of their religious beliefs. 
If you choose not to be a foster parent, there are other ways of helping, such as mentoring, supporting foster families. And one thing that MMCC does is during the Ramadan and Eid, is they put together a nice effort where they collect um, donated items and um, donate to the Muslim foster children Ramadan and Eid gap and Eid gift baskets at that time. So that completes Muna's notes, um, and I'm going to give it back to Fazia. Thank you, Rania. We certainly are missing Muna, but her. Um, the information that she shares as being somebody who works in the Wayne County Courts um, is so valuable because I think it's remarkable to know that there have been Muslim children in the foster care system for years and years. And the fact that our table is not full of Muslim foster parents just goes to show that we need a lot of support. This, this effort needs a lot of support. So I'm so glad, again, to see all of you here. Our next speaker, also another dear friend of mine, um, is Simina Zahur. She is married, a mother of three boys, and lives in Canton. She works as a physician in private practice. She became a licensed foster care parent with her husband, Imran, in 2012. She fostered a young Muslim boy for two and a half years, and she's going to share her experience with all of you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's, it's really uh, nice to see so many people interested in this uh, topic. Uh, I gave, we gave a talk, I think, at our masjid, not well, maybe a year or two ago, and Mashallah, you know, it seems as though the interest is growing, so I'm definitely um, looking forward to uh, more families uh, taking part, inshallah. So as uh, Fawzia said, we uh, became foster parents in 2012, and actually, as the, um, as the Imam talked about the hadith with, you know, the Prophet Muhammad talking about the person who took care of the orphan was, would be like this, it was really that, and, and our sheikh was just he just made a plea to our community saying that we have so many, we have Muslim children in, in the foster care system. We need to have families. And we had about 50 families interested, alhamdulillah. But out of those 50, only two actually eventually went through the whole licensing process and we were one of them. And I think what happens is people are very enthusiastic in the beginning and then as they go through the process, which can be a little bit tedious and lengthy, um, people lose interest. But uh, alhamdulillah, we became licensed in, in 2012, and actually not soon after, I got a call from, an, from our agency saying that they had a five-and-a-half-year-old boy who they had picked up from the school uh, who could not go home because of, um, it was unsafe for him to be at home. And they literally gave me half an hour to an hour to make a decision whether or not I could accept him. So I did a sahara, and uh, you know I think that I, you know we had already thought that this would be an age group that would be good for us having three boys of my own. And um, two hours after I said yes, um, you know Rashid was brought with just the clothes on his back and a backpack with a change of clothes. And half an hour later, the the care worker left, and we were sitting there just kind of looking at each other and. Um, he was very quiet, and you know, my children tried to play with him a little bit, and then he got really teary-eyed, and we tried to eat dinner, and he wouldn't eat dinner, and um, we said, okay, he said he wanted to go to sleep, and then we offered him the bed, and he refused to sleep in the bed, and he didn't really know what to do. I think he was, she just thought he was going to come and play and go back home, and he said, and he was just like, I, I want to go home, and this five-and-a-half-year-old child saying, and then... You know, we, we made a little tent for him in um, my son's room. And he went in, then he started crying. And he started crying, and he started sobbing. And, you know, we asked if there was anything that we could do to make him feel better. And he just said, I just want to talk to my mom. I just want to go home. I just want to talk to my mom. And, of course, we couldn't. We couldn't. It actually took about a month before he was able to visit with his parents. Um, so the first two weeks were very challenging. Um, he cried often. Uh, he, um, you know, my children actually were, were quite worried in the beginning because they had never really thought that anybody could take 
kids away from their parents. And trying to reassure them while trying to help him adjust was definitely challenging. Um, when uh, we uh, took him to the school, we decided to enroll him in Crescent, which is the Islamic school in Canton, because that's where my son went. Um, when they tested him, he was supposed to be in kindergarten because of his age, but when, we tested, when they tested him, they said that he didn't even meet their preschool requirement. He only knew two, 12 letters of the alphabet, and they were really having a hard time in accepting him to the school because he, would, he had such a big deficit academically. But alhamdulillah, um, alhamdulillah, I think they, uh, you know, we, they realized that my putting him there was, had less to do with academics but more to do with the environment. Um, they agreed, and he's, he started with three, three months left um, in kindergarten with the understanding that if he didn't meet, meet the requirement, he would have to repeat the school year. Anyway, um, you know, when he first came again, he was supposed to be potty trained, but he regressed. He, you know, he wet himself a lot. We had to put him in pull-ups initially. Um, he, when we tried to give him his first uh, shower, he, he started screaming, um, please, please don't burn me, please, please don't burn me. Um, we had to use a bucket of water and a small cup and slowly pour it over him to, to help him understand that it wasn't burning water. Um, you know, just things that we didn't think he would have trouble with, but, but even brushing his teeth, he, he had never used toothpaste before, five and a half years of age, and he said that you know, he couldn't use toothpaste and we'd have to try different flavors, and finally the bubblegum flavor, a small, tiny amount. I mean, things that we didn't think we'd have to train a five and a half year old child to do, it, it, it was um, definitely something you know, that was uh, a learning experience for all of us. Um, When we first started going to school, he would wake up and he'd say, oh, I don't want to really go today. And we'd say, well, you got to go to school every day. And he'd say, well, my mom said I don't have to go to school if I don't want to. And, you know, I mean, these were things that we took for granted. Our kid, we took for granted that our kids were doing these things. And, I, and we finally realized that's probably one of the reasons why he was so far behind. Um, but alhamdulillah, with the help of um, my mother and um, the teachers, uh, he went from being a grade behind in three months, he caught up to his kindergarten level, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Um, initially when he came, he did have a lot of um, use of bad language. I had to have um, some very open discussions with my children about inappropriate language and that understanding that he came from a home that maybe didn't um, teach him what bad language was. Um, they, uh, I had to have a very tough conversation with my children about what good touch was, what bad touch was, what, um, you know, if they uh, have an open communication of if they felt uncomfortable in any way or if there were things that he might have said or did that they weren't sure about that they would come to me. I mean, it, you know, you're taking in a child that you really don't know the background. But subhanAllah, as, as traumatic and, and challenging um, as it was when he first came, um, I mean, to see where he came from and where he went to was nothing short of a, of a miracle. And, you know, and I'm here to say that you know, me sitting up here should not make you think that this is something that, that I was able to do. Me being up here represents my husband who shared the responsibility of taking him back and forth to, see, to visit his parents once a week, of taking him to the therapist and the doctor appointments and all the different appointments that he needed. Um, my children who shared their home, their, their room, and their family with the child and, and, and took him in as a brother. Um, my extended family who welcomed him as another member of the family, uh, you know, inviting him over and loving him and hugging him. Uh, our community, subhanAllah. Um, I had, um, I don't know if Shabnam's here today, but you, most of you know Shabnam Khan. She called me a week after he came and said, Sveena, you know, um, let me take him somewhere once a week. And she would literally come and she would pick him up and she would take him to the library one day, she would take him to the museum one day, there was a fair going on. And these are things that you don't always have time to do when you have kids of your own and you're trying to manage work and, you, and, and really people like that who dropped off school um, supplies and clothes that, that 
the sons or the kids that were his age that he grew out of. I mean, it really took a community and a village to raise him. Um, and he blossomed to a place I, I never think, I never thought, as I said, when he first came, we thought he was, we thought he was learning disabled, we thought he was, you know, had behavioral issues, but he really, subhanAllah, I mean, the resilience that Mona talks about um, is so true. I mean, he, and, and he, he didn't always talk about things from home, but we just, conversations, things would come up, and we talk about something about, oh, we have a small, you know, leak in the roof, and he said, oh, yeah, I, I I lived in a place once where half the roof was gone and, and it was kind of dra raining on me and, and then one time there was a small bug in the corner and he said, oh yeah, I remember when I was sleeping one time on the floor and the, the bugs were kind of crawling and biting me and, and you know, just in conversation he would bring things up and, and subhanAllah it really took us out of the bubble that we all live in and you know, the blessings that we have um, really helped us really realize you know, how fortunate that, that we are, subhanAllah. Rashid went from not only knowing few letters, um, he, was, he was so excited to learn. He went from a child that didn't want to go to school to a child that just wanted to learn, just wanted to learn as much as he could. And he saw my um, niece learning Quran, and he asked my mother if he could learn too. And subhanAllah, he learned from letters to doing qaida to actually finishing reading the entire Quran with the Jweed last, uh, just in J June of this year, and still reads, still reads, subhanAllah, with her. Uh, you know, he's, he really is a testament to the resilience of children and to the benefit of having a child in a community, in a Muslim community. And I, I, um, I really, really feel, truly feel that if he had been in a non-Muslim home that he would not have, um, that he would, would have lost his deen. And as, as upset as his parents were that, that he was taken away from them and as upset and as hostile as they were to the agency and the, the, the you know, screaming and yelling at them, when they met with us, every time they met with us, they couldn't thank us enough. I mean, they couldn't say enough that they were just thankful that at least he was in a Muslim home. And I mean, I can't imagine how it is for a child to be taken away from their parents and then to be put in a home that doesn't understand their cultural or or religious beliefs, um, and Rashid really is one of the lucky ones because, subhanAllah, there are so many children that are living in good families. I'm not saying they're bad, they're still good, alhamdulillah, good families, but I, I feel that as a community, we will be held accountable for the fact that we are not taking care of these children ourselves. And I thank you for your attention, and um, I pray that, inshallah, that some of you can can um, find it in your hearts to open up, open up your homes and, and, and think about, consider doing this too, inshallah. Thank you, Samina. I've heard Samina give this talk more than once and every time I, I just feel like so honored to know somebody like this, um, somebody who had the courage to take the steps, to step outside of the box and do something that not many people had done. With Samina's family's efforts, the life of this one boy changed. I saw Rashid a couple of months ago in the summer, and he's you know been he's adopted now um, in a permanent home, inshallah. I mean, it's just this boy has blossomed. He is a beautiful, beautiful child. And I really, really think, you know, so much of that effort goes to Samina, her family, the community, subhanAllah. So I am going to share with you a letter from um, somebody who could not be with us tonight, but she is, she was in the foster care system, the domestic foster care system, and she wanted to share her story with you, uh, even though she couldn't be here tonight. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Amal. I was born and raised in Egypt, came to the USA at the age of 14. I am now a junior, a junior at Western Michigan University, majoring in social work. Growing up, I was blessed with a wonderful, loving, and caring family anyone could dream of 
alhamdulillah, I never thought once in my life that I would be a part of the foster care system. But because of unforeseen circumstances, I was placed in the child welfare system at the age of 15. At that point, I was taken away from everything and everyone I knew and loved. I was first placed in a shelter and then a group home where I lived for about two years. During that time, my worker, lawyer, and agency I stayed with tried their best to find a Muslim foster family, but sadly, there were none. I lost hope in finding a Muslim family after waiting for a year and a half. At that point, I didn't really care what religion they were anymore. Later, my lawyer found a good family who was Christian. We met and both liked each other. They were very nice. My worker started doing the paperwork so I could move in with them as soon as possible. A week before moving, I got a phone call that I will no longer move in without any explanation for why. Two months later, I got a phone call from my lawyer saying that she found a Muslim family. I was so happy because Ramadan and Eid was coming soon, and this year, I would not spend it alone. My foster family were originally from Pakistan. We had a different culture, exceptions, and the list can go on and on, but none of these factors made them change their mind. In all honesty, if I did not find them, I would have lost my deen, and I would not be where I am today. I will forever be thankful, grateful, and indebted for what they have done for me. And that's Amal's story. And Amal was taken in by a single mother who was going through her own hardships. But despite that, she was having lunch with Mona Youssef, who could not be here tonight. And Mona had no expectations that this single mother of two would, would be interested in something like this. But subhanAllah, because Allah has a reason for everything, they met and this person took in Amal. And now you know Amal's story. So next we're gonna hear again from Rania Shabib, and Rania's gonna talk about her experience as a foster parent to um, a child um, that is not domestic foster care. Assalamu alaikum again. Um, this time I'm speaking as a foster parent. Um, so as Fazia said, I have three younger children, um, 11, 10, and six years old. And maybe about a year ago, year and a half ago, um, I heard that there were some Muslim children that were in the foster care system and they were in non-Muslim homes. And this really, really hit home for me. And you know, immediately I think of my own children and these children could be any one of our kids and what excuse did I have to not welcome them into my home. Um, so at that point, I went through an agency called Child, um, Orchard Children's Services, and they are a domestic licensing agency. Um, as soon as we started the process, I got word that Lutheran Social Services of Michigan does licensing for domestic and refugee um, foster parenting. So I decided to go that route and look into that. And initially when I went into the foster care system, I, I really thought that um, we were more leaning towards being domestic foster parents. And Amanda, who is our, was my family's licensing worker, um, brought up the topic of possibly welcoming in a refugee foster child. And the refugee foster children are Typically, they're teenagers between the ages of 13 to 17. So my initial thought was, well, I've never parented a teenager before. You know, that that's very new for me. I don't, I don't know how I'd feel about that. Um, but Amanda really knows what she's doing, and <laughs> she, she very nicely um, would mention it to me. And she told me about Farhia, who is now um, our foster daughter. Um, and we decided to welcome Farhia to our home. She is originally from Somalia. Um, she is now 17, 
and she was previously in a non-Muslim home for about a year and a half um, before we welcomed her to our home, uh, before we became licensed. Um, as soon as she was placed in the foster care system, she immediately requested a Muslim home, and unfortunately, at the time, there were no Muslim homes that were licensed for refugee foster care. So we became licensed, and we were able to welcome her to our home, and she told me that every day she would make dua for Allah to send her a Muslim family. Every day. And I told her, I said, Farhia, you see how much Allah loves you? That we became licensed and you came to our home. And she said, yes, Khale Rania. She calls me Khale, which means aunt in Arabic. She said, yes, Khale Rania, but it took me a year. <laughs> and I said, I know, I know, but you know, now you're the only refugee foster child here that is with a Muslim family. Um, and I say that because I think it's important that we don't forget that there are still a lot of um, refugee foster kids that are already here that are in non-Muslim homes that would love to be in Muslim homes. Um, like I said, Farhia is originally from Somalia. Um, my family is originally from Syria. And so when, um, you, as you know, that there will be some refugee foster children coming from Syria in the near future. And one of the things that I was met with in the community was, well, why didn't you, why didn't you get, why didn't you bring a Syrian refugee foster kid to your home? And I was just like, you know, what does it matter? There's a child that's here right now that needs a Muslim home, and why can't that be us? You know, there's, there's no need to wait. Um, just like uh, Fazia said, Amal was originally from Egypt and her foster family was Pakistani. So there might be some differences in culture, but essentially we're Muslim. And so our, our you know, our, our day-to-day -day routines are very similar. What we eat, our prayer, um, celebrating Ramadan. Uh, Farhia told me that the hardest thing for her was Ramadan that that was very difficult for her to be fasting during Ramadan and to not be in a Muslim home and not have her Muslim community around her. And again, please keep in mind that, like uh, somebody said previously, Farhia was, had a great um, foster family that she was with before coming to our home. Very good people, I've met them, they're wonderful. But at the end of the day, they weren't Muslim. They weren't Muslim, and it was just, it, it was different for her. And she still yearned for that Islamic atmosphere. Um, I remember once I took her to Unity Center for Salat al Jum'a, ah, and she had said that it had been a year and a half since she had been to Salat al Jum'a. Ah. So these are the things that sometimes we might take for granted, but these are the things that we can give these children when they're in a Muslim home. Um, going back between the differences, the differences between um, refugee foster kids and domestic foster kids. Like I said, the refugees are teenagers. They're typically boys. Um, the parents are usually deceased or missing. So reunification is usually not um, a goal. Uh, they stay in the system until they age out, which is between the ages of 18 to 21. Now, we said with domestic foster kids, there's a, a some extent of trauma that they experience going from one home that they're familiar with, that they've known to a completely new home and family. With refugee foster kids, that's um, magnified even more because it's a new country, a new language, um, new technology, new schooling. Um, many of them have missed several years of formal schooling and they might be behind academically. So there's a lot of knew that they're confronted with without having the familiarity of, of their family and people they know. Um, another thing is with domestic foster kids, since the goal is reunification, there's the regular family visits with their birth parents. With refugee foster kids, they don't have any family that's here with them, so those visits aren't, um, there aren't any visits. Um, Lutheran does a really nice job of their caseworkers, the therapists, they all do home visits, so I don't have to worry about um, taking Farhia to an appointment, you know, something outside of the home. They very kindly drive all the way from Lansing, so that makes it a little bit easier for me as well. 
Now, I know that there is some, at least for me, when we decided to become licensed, there was some anxiety before taking in a foster child because it's an unknown. Um, and people ask me, well, isn't it risky? Yes, there is some risk involved. And for me, that's when I relied a lot on uh, dua and istikhara. And I did that for a very long time. And I really just put my faith in Allah and it was just uh, pure tawakkul, really just tawakkul that if, if this is what is good for us and if this is what is right, then please ya Allah make this easy for our family. And you would not believe how easy it was for our family and how yes said it was. Um, there were times when I would tell Amanda, she would schedule us for a training, and I would say, go ahead and schedule us, but I don't know how I'm going to get Ennis there. You know, I don't, I don't know, but schedule us. We'll see how it happens. And the child care was taken care of. I was able to get my husband there, and things really just started to fall into place. And this, for me, was a clear sign that this was something that we should do and something that Allah, inshallah, would, would make easy for us. Now, there is some, there is some um, concept, or misconception that, oh, well, they're teenagers, they don't really need our attention, and that is far from the truth. They definitely need our attention. They need help adjusting. They need help learning the new language. And another thing with the refugee foster kids is soon they are going to be living on their own. And so part of being a foster parent is teaching them the independent life skills so that when they are on their own, um, they're prepared for that. Now, I, I can't say too much about Farhia because I do want to respect her privacy. She is with us still in the community. Um, she doesn't really enjoy the spotlight. <laughs> you know, she just kind of wants to be a regular teenager. Um, so, so I try to give that to her. Um, Now, I do want to say before my time is up that mark your calendars for November 7th at 11 a.m. at the Muslim Unity Center. There will be an orientation, which is the first step of the licensing process for anyone that would like to be licensed through Lutheran. Amanda will be there. She will be doing the orientation. It takes about two hours, and we would need um, both the hu husband and wife, both spouses, to be present at the orientation. Single family homes are welcome to attend as well. And that will be at the Unity Center again. And I just want to close by saying that I know that being a foster parent might not be for everyone, but even if you choose not to foster, please continue the, to support the families that are fostering. You can help by offering tutoring, by mentoring, by driving, by providing certain necessities, and really even just your dua is helpful. You can also be a alternate caregiver or help with respite care. Thank you. Thank you, Rania. I think that, um, you know, it's also, as Rania said, there is there's a role for everybody um, in what they can do because not only do the foster parents need support, um, whether it's the respite care or just the driving, um, but the children, the foster children, um, whether you are a foster parent or not, they just need somebody embracing them, somebody not making them feel like the other, as Imam Ali said. Um, and the children, um, the biological children of the foster parents should really be applauded because it's not always their decision what their parents are doing, but they need to recognize and, and be applauded for, um, for, for what they're doing as well. So Amanda Blasius is our next speaker, and she's been employed at Lutheran Social Services as a licensing specialist for the last year and a half. She graduated with her bachelor's of social work for, from Central Michigan University in 2007, and she also graduated from Western Michigan University with her master's in social work in 2010. She has experience working in the child welfare field, domestic violence programs, and also with military families and veterans. In her free time, she enjoys spending time with her family outdoors. 
Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for inviting us. It means a lot for us to be present and provide our information about our program. Um, like she said, I am from Lutheran Social Services and we started in 1934 in Detroit and we started, our agency started by helping the homeless. Since then, we have grown to be the largest, we are the largest private um, agency in the lower part of Michigan and we do service all the way from Detroit to Grand Rapids and I was in Holland earlier this week and now I'm in Detroit. So I starting to drive all over the state. Um, so we care for probably 800 youth every day within our programs. Um, within the Lutheran Social Services, we do have programs to help the elderly, but within the child welfare field, we have um, our domestic program and then our refugee program. I was in a licensing worker for a domestic program and now I am working with the refugee department, so I do have experience in both programs. Um, and some of the services we provide in both of them there will be we provide case management for the youth who are in foster care. Um, we have therapists, we have mentors who are working with them, we have um, tutors who are working with them, and we just have, we have case aides who are providing transportation to and from the visits sometimes. So we have lots of different people who are helping these youth in our programs. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about our refugee program, um, but if you guys have questions afterwards about domestic, feel free to ask them. Um, over the last six months, all of our referrals um, for refugee foster care were for Muslim youth. Um, and we really have only, we only have the one Muslim home, which is Rania's home, thank, thank you. Um, so we have been placing all of our youth in non-Muslim homes. Um, and it really became um, a priority to us when the youth in Rania's home requested to be in a Muslim home. And it took us a good even over six months just to kind of network and get into different organizations and raise awareness about the need for Muslim homes. Um, so we were very thankful we could find our Muslim home, but then it kind of became aware that we have all these other youth who are placed in non-Muslim homes and it would be very beneficial to be able to place them in a Muslim home. Um, most of the youth who are coming into care are ages 16 to 17. Um, right now we are seeing a huge need for um, foster home, refugee foster homes for males. Um, that's what we're seeing, what's most of the referrals that we're having to turn away. So, because most of the youth are fleeing on their own in their ages 14 to 17 um, who are needing the homes right now. Um, sorry. We um, also just started a new program. It's our treatment foster care program. And this is also for refugees, so before, if we saw a referral for refugee youth who had a little bit more needs, had a little bit more trauma or emotional, um, went through a little bit more emotional trauma, they were going into more of a residential setting. Um, but right now we're starting a new program for treatment foster care. So if you feel like your family is a little bit more equipped, have a little bit more experience to care for children who have more high needs, this would be a good program for you. You still have to go through the licensing process, but it's more intensive care. You'll get more case management. Um, the daily stipend is a little bit higher. Um, and it's just more of a team base to care for that youth. So we're seeing a need for those um, homes also. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the licensing process since that's my main job. Um, the first step to be um, a licensed foster parent is like what Anya said, you have to go through the orientation process. The orientation process is the first step. It does not require that you become a licensed foster parent if you just attend orientation. It's just to give you more in-depth information about the licensing process and being a foster parent. Um, it does last about two hours, and then at the end of orientation, you'll be, you'll be provided an application. And if you choose to sign the application, that's what starts the licensing process. Um, the licensing process, we like to say it lasts 100 days. Um, we can move faster if needed. Right now, we're getting a lot of um, people who are wanting to be licensed foster parents, so I don't know if it'll move much faster because there's only a few of us um, working across the state right now. Um, but the state gives us 180 days to license you, so we can't go over 180 days. So it's good to kind of think about it, um, talk about it as a family, even, you know, it's very important to talk with your children because these are kids coming into their home too, and sometimes they're sharing a bedroom with them. Um, they have a hard time because they may be losing time with their parents, so it's good to have a family, make a family decision on what's best for your family before moving forward with signing the application. Um, once you've signed the application, I usually do three home visits. Um, we have to walk through the whole house. We check simple things like smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. I have to measure bedrooms. Um, 
I get to measure your water, make sure it's 100, under 120 degrees. Um, so very simple things you might see me doing, um, but that's just part of the licensing process. Um, you Each family member will have to go to the doctor and have a medical clearance done. Um, you, the foster parents, the, um, the spouses will have to be fingerprinted. Um, so we'll check your background. Um, we will request three unrelated references that I, we will mail information to um, to get their information, their feedback, and what they think about you being a foster parent. Um, Sometimes we do have to check all your financial information, and that is just because some people in the past have decided they thought they could make money off the foster care system, so now we have to assess everyone just to make sure that you have enough income after your bills and expenses to care for these children. Um, before you receive the daily rate to care for them. So it may seem very intrusive, but it's the same for everyone who becomes a licensed foster parent. So we'll collect pay stubs and collect all copies of all your bills. Um, so that's, if you have any pets, that we would check for vaccinations and licenses. Um, but that's the main part that's a little bit intrusive. Um, it's kind of like opening your home and sharing your everything personal with me. You'll fill out a big social history. Um, and we'll go through that together. So it's, it can be intrusive, um, but in the end of the day, it's, it, this is the most intrusive part. And then once you're licensed, it makes everything a lot easier. Um, Lutheran Social Services can license you for domestic and refugee. Um, our refugee department, we're based out of Lansing, but we will travel to throughout the state to meet with you. Um, if you're thinking you're gonna do domestic, we have offices in Detroit, in Troy, Ann Arbor, um, I think that's the majority of them over here that would be closest to you guys. So you guys could pick one of those offices um, and say you care for um, domestic foster children for a while and then you decide your passion is more towards refugee, you can always transfer your license over to our um, agency in Lansing. So once you're licensed for one, you can switch if you ever feel like you need to in the future. Um, and I'm, some of you have probably heard about the Syrian um, refugees coming over. We have not seen referrals for them yet, but we do anticipate that increasing in the next year or two. Um, the reason for that, we think, is because each refugee that's coming over is going through high security checks and medical clearances, and the workers who are doing those are just being overwhelmed right now, so we aren't seeing very many of the Syrian refugees yet. We do anticipate that to change, um, but the first step, if you really feel like that's the passion and the population you wanna care for, I would encourage you to just think about the licensing process because we cannot place, if we get those referrals, we can only place them in licensed foster homes. We don't say we get a referral, we cannot accept that referral until we have a home that says yes for them. So a lot of people think they're just here in the US waiting for homes that we cannot accept the referral and they won't start the travel process to come over and so we have a licensed home that said, yes, we will accept this child. Um, so even though it could be a year or two out, it's best to start the licensing process, just be prepared and prepare your family. And that way when we do receive them, we can easily accept these children so they're not sitting in the camps any longer. Um, and I think both the foster parents shared very good information. I think if you, can't, if you don't feel like fostering is great for you, like they said, just supporting a foster family by providing alternative care. A lot of times they just need a break when they're getting overwhelmed or say they just wanna spend a day with their own biological children. So just taking that child, the foster child um, on a special day trip can be very helpful or if they're going away on the weekend. Um, foster children have to get approved through the judge to go out of state, so sometimes that doesn't always happen fast enough, so it's good to have an alternative caregiver who can care for that child for a weekend or a week while they're out of state. Um, or if you don't feel like, if you can't be an alternative caregiver, just being a mentor or a tutor. Um, with a lot of the refugee children coming, we need translators. That's a huge need that we're struggling with. So if you speak any languages, seeing if we have any youth that speak those same languages and helping us translate. Um, so there's lots of different ways you can help um, without being a licensed foster parent. Um, we, I brought a bunch of information that's in the back, so if you feel like you're somewhat interested, grab that. Um, we will have the orientation next Saturday at 11, so if you feel like you and your family would be interested, um, discuss, about, discuss it, and feel free to come out to the orientation um, next week. Thank you, Amanda. In terms of the orientation next week, just to reiterate, that's at um, Muslim Unity Center at 11 a.m. 
and um, they're asking that you register, pre-register beforehand. So Amanda and Rania, how can um, the community members here get access to that registration? The, we, I have a copy of the flyer, um, and we'll make sure that we can get it accessible on either the IAGD website or to anybody who um, is interested. Um, we, we can get that over to you. Oh, it's not required to register for beforehand. Okay, okay. Other orientations, Amanda? Um, we do have other orientations. They won't be um, presented by me necessarily. I am gonna be in Flint on Sunday at one at the um, mosque there by Swartz Creek. I don't know the address by heart. Um, but if you want to go to a different orientation, those don't fit. We, um, our Troy office and our Detroit office have orientations almost weekly. I don't know if I have the schedule with me, but I could, I'll leave my card, and if you guys want to attend one of those, um, you can call me and I can register you for one of those too. So those are throughout the week um, at different times, but they will, the orientation for domestic and refugee is the same throughout the board, and so is the licensing process. So it doesn't really matter where you go. Um, if you're going with Lutheran Social Services, it's going to be the same orientation no matter where. And I do have, I did make a sign up sheet. Um, if you guys want to come to the November 7th, I can um, place that in the back when we're all done, too. Um, the children are not allowed to travel outside of the country. Um, they can travel throughout to different states, but they need approval from the judge, but out of the country they cannot travel. Foster parents can go, but they need to find someone to care for the child. Um, what was the other question? The licensing process, um, 180 days is the very max. I'd like to say 100 days is my goal, um, but once I'm done with my process, I have to send my report to the state of Michigan and they have to approve it, and then that's out of my hands of how long they want they take. So it could take um, two weeks to a month before they approve it. They don't have to be licensed, but they have to have a background check and a central registry check, which makes sure there's no abuse or neglect in their background. Um, and then if they're going to drive the child, we will check their driving record and uh, make sure they have car, appropriate car insurance. So, but that can be a family member or anyone who, you, who can pass the background checks and is willing to care for them. Um, but they cannot, the foster child cannot be out of your home more than 10 days. So they have to, on the 11th day, they have to come back into the licensed foster home. Whether it's for a day, that's fine. Um, and then they go back, but they have, once we hit that 11 day, we consider that a new placement and they have to be in a licensed foster home. Um, we have lots of single parents um, who are foster parents. I, it's the same process, and I don't think it's very difficult at all. Um, it just you might have to rely a little bit more on your support system um, and have some um, a few more alternative caregivers cleared just in case there's an emergency. But it's the same process, and we have lots of single parents. Um, the foster children can stay in the um, a licensed foster home until they're 21. If you choose to keep them in the home after that, that's your choice. Um, they just won't, you won't get any reimbursement from the state and they won't get any reimbursement from the state either. But if you want to keep them in your home, that's fine. Um, usually, sometimes we have independent living program and those are youth who don't necessarily have to be in a foster home. They can just be in a home that wants to help a youth. Um, so if you don't feel like the licensing process is okay, you don't want to go through it because it's long and tedious and very intensive, and you have an extra bedroom, and you just want to help all youth earn those independent living skills, you could also provide independent living, and they could stay in your home till 21 um, until they're ready to move on to college or move out on their own. It just kind of helps them save money um, until they're ready to be on their own. Does that answer your question? Um, you just you don't have to be necessarily a citizen. You just have to have a permanent resi residency card or a green card. You can, I think so. 
<laughs> no, you don't have to be licensed. We just complete a background check and then you'll meet with, you'll probably do an interview, um, but it's a very quick process if you want to be a mentor. I'm looking for a tutor for my foster daughter, so if you're available, I live on Square Lake and Adams if you're in the area. Um, and to somebody that was asking about the orientation, if you can't make uh, the November 7th one at Unity Center, um, I have a list, I think you gave it to me, or somebody gave it to me, of the dates and the locations for November and December um, that are like Troy, Detroit, Troy and Detroit. So I can leave that with Saba and maybe she can share it with the community. Are there any other questions? Yes. Actually, I am going to defer that question to Saba because um, Saba's uh, kind of heading up the Muslim mental health support for some of the Syrian, well, the Syrian refugees, I would say, but there's also Muslim mental health support um, needed elsewhere, so Rania, I'll let you answer that. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we usually uh, pray Aisha at uh, age 15, but today we'll just, since we are in the prayer hall, we'll delay it for until we answer these questions, inshallah. Hopefully it's not going to take so long, right? Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you, uh, Lubna Baji. She's uh, also a child psychiatrist, as am I. And I mentioned this at Unity Center, I think it was two weeks ago. But we are actually starting a mental health initiative um, with uh, myself, Dr. Farah Abbasi, who's a psychiatrist at MSU, and some other local practitioners, where we're actually going to be we're working on uh, planning, actually, uh, training for um, anybody that's going to be involved with um, caring for uh, uh, incoming refugees. We'll see how this goes, and maybe this can actually, we'll, you know, it might grow and develop into something that can be a support even for Muslim families that are fostering even domestic children. I think that's actually a really good thought. Um, so that's what we're working on right now to develop trainings to kind of um, educate and um, basically educate all those people that are going to be involved with taking care of foster children, refugees. Because um, that's really important to take care of ourselves and, and what we call trauma-informed care. So kind of have an um, know what the expectations are of m welcoming somebody into your home or even if whatever your uh, interaction is going to be. Um, I think when you have an expectation and you understand and you're educated, then you're much, um, it, it's going to be much easier to make that transition, inshallah. So we're working on it. Thank you, Saba. Are there any other questions? Um, he asked if the process is any faster if people didn't want the government help. Um, anyone who's going to care for a foster child, they have to be licensed, and we will pay you whether you need the money or not. Um, we would just encourage you maybe to put in a savings account for the youth. Um, but the state, we're licensed with the state, so we have to follow all our rules because we're audited on them. So we have to have the foster home follow those rules too. Um, the process can move fast if you guys are willing, if the, fast, if the family is willing to move fast. Rania was amazing at getting her paperwork in, um, so she made it very easy to move the process along. Because you'll get like a packet, it's like 13 pages each that each spouse has to fill out. Um, so that can take a while, and just getting all your bills and documentation can take a while. So the faster that you, that you move, the faster we can move. Um, so it kind of goes at your speed. And now maybe it's going to go at our caseload speed, um, too. But it can it can go faster than the 100 days if you guys get your paperwork in. Um, and then one thing I did forget to add is um, there is a PRIDE training that you'll have to take. And PRIDE stands for Parent Resource Information Development Education. Any licensed foster parent has to go through this. Um, you have to complete 12 hours at the beginning before you're licensed. And 12, you have to, 
or you can, and then there's 12 hours after your license. You could do it all up front if you want to do the 24 hours up front, but you only have to do it 12 hours before. So that can be very time consuming because it is classroom setting. So find the time that both parents can go to that training um, can be time consuming. Now that we're getting to the end of that year, there's not as many trainings available, but they are available at all child welfare agencies, so you don't have to necessarily go through our agency either. Um, so that can be a time consuming aspect too of getting the, the training done. So does that answer? Okay. Um, I know our Troy in Detroit office, they do offer them in the evening and one in the day. I think the evening one starts around 5.30. Um, the one next week will be on a Saturday. And it's during the day. It's at 11. Um, but, yeah, there are some. I think they alternate between day and evening. And if you guys, if you and your spouse cannot go together, you at least have to at least attend one. So if one can go during the day and the one can go in the evening, it's all the same information given each time. So you don't necessarily have to go together as long as you both attend it before you sign the application. Go ahead. Um, we do, I usually allow, I don't know if the state wants me to say this out loud, but I allow some foster parents to watch the videos because of your schedules. Um, I do like you to go to a few classroom settings. So the ones I'd like you to go to for classroom settings are discipline, that covers discipline, um, there's one that covers loss, and there's one that covers attachment. So I'd like you to go to those ones for the classroom settings because I think it's good to talk in groups and get other people's perspectives. Um, but I try and make it easy on you if I possibly can. We only have one set of these videos, so I don't know what we're going to do now um, since we have so many people interested. I know they're looking to they're taping us and trying to get more online, so I'm hoping it'll be easier. So you might have to watch it fast if we're going to do videos. <laughs> so. I don't know. There's someone in the back, too. Yep, when you're licensed, you choose what you want in your home. Um, I will make my recommendation and discuss that with you if I don't feel like it's a good fit for your family, but you guys can choose if a male is a better fit for your family, if female is better, um, if you want to take siblings, which... For domestic, we really need homes that can take sibling groups. We see a lot of siblings, three, we see, I've seen siblings as many as seven who've come into care and we can't even place some, two of them together sometimes. So yeah, sorry, that's just a little plug. If you can take siblings, please take them because I hate seeing them split up. Um, but yes, you can choose your ages, you can choose the, the sex, um, you can choose how severe you want their needs to be. Um, you can choose the race, you can choose the religion that you prefer. So we really put it in your hands because we want to make sure you can care for these children and it's a good fit for them to be in your home. Can you, I, sorry, I can't hear the last part. Yep, um, we, you'll have a case manager. Each child has a case manager, um, and you'll sometimes maybe have daily contact with them, but they'll be in your home at least monthly, so they'll be your main support that you'll reach out to. Um, as a licensing worker, I'm, I'm the foster parent's advocate. The case manager is the child's advocate, so if I need to step in and support you or find other resources, that's my responsibility. Um, we do hold, we have a support group at Lutheran. It is held in Lansing right now, but if we get more homes out here, maybe we can look at offering one in this area, too. Um, and then we also have usually three events each year, um, like holiday events, where you can come together and meet other foster parents, too. So, And you'll have the support of a therapist you can talk with. I know some therapists are doing, like, family therapy. So we try our best to support you. Um, I just want to add, since I've um, been a foster parent, the Lutheran family is amazing. I mean, I feel like I've gotten to know, I don't know if there's anybody in the office that I haven't gotten to know, but there's such a network, um, and they are, they're so resourceful, and they are readily available, um, whether email or phone call, they're always there, and um, it's a great team. It's a great team. Thank you everybody for attending this evening and the last thing I will just say is please, please consider what you can do to help and um, what part you can play. Thank you.
But remember, it takes three to six months to get licensed, and they will not come from that country unless there's a licensed home for them to be in. Thank you very much for the information. Thank you, Mayor Lawson. I will reward you for what you have done, you. setting a good example for the community. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless you. Uh, today, after the khutbah, uh, someone, three brothers actually, uh, they came to me with their tears in their eyes. They said, you reminded us of what our father did. Because he brought a girl and two boys who were just abandoned. And they grew up with us. And the girl stayed with us until she got married. And he took care of everything okay, um, regarding his marriage. No, uh, and no, I hope, uh, what I said resonated no, without it happened. So they, they, they no, cried when they remember what they did okay. with these, with these no, children. Another good outcome came out of the uh, after the party so yeah. senior yeah. citizens yeah. who no, said we don't have no, children at home, no, can we cannot take no, care of them, but we can whatever we can do, we can teach them, we can take them around, we can educate them, teach them. No, no, I I know the organization for citizens and we can do it. Yeah, we have time. No, I'd be happy to, no, help, no, 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 reassure, you know, you know, I know how to act like a gentleman, keep my Hopefully in the future we can do what the Luke and Family Service can do. What's your name? Muslim Family Services. I know in الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلا حي على الفلا
Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar La ilaha illa